To which the poet answered, the more I think of God, he is still the more dark and unknown to me. Indeed, no wonder that he made such an answer, for he that would tell what God is in a measure suitable to his excellency and glory had need to know God even as he is known of him, which is not competent to any man upon earth. Agua puzzles the whole creation with that sublime question, what is his name? Proverbs 30 verse 4. But though it is impossible in our present state to know God perfectly, seeing he is incomprehensible, yet so much of him is revealed in the scriptures as is necessary for us to know in order to our salvation. The text tells us, and it should be remembered, that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, who lay in the bosom of the Father, and who only can reveal him, is here the speaker, that God is a spirit. It is but little of the nature of spirits that we, who dwell in tabernacles of clay, are so intimately connected with flesh and blood, and so naturally impressed with sensible objects, can know. We cannot fully understand what our own spirits or souls are, and less do we know of the nature of angels who are of a superior nature to us, and far less can we know of the spiritual nature of the divine being, which is utterly incomprehensible by men or angels. However, as all our ideas begin at what is infinite in considering the nature of spirits, so we are led to conceive of God as infinitely more perfect than any finite spirit. All we can know of spirits is, one, that a spirit is the most perfect and excellent of beings, more excellent than the body or anything that is purely material. Two, that a spirit is in its own nature immortal, having nothing in its frame and constitution tending to dissolution or corruption. Three, that a spirit is capable of understanding, willing, and putting forth actions agreeable to its nature, which no other being can do. Now these conceptions of the nature of spirits lead us to conceive of God. One, as a being that is more perfect and excellent than all other spirits and beings. Hence he is said to be incorruptible, Romans 1.23, immortal and invisible, 1 Timothy 1.17. He has understanding and will, and so we conceive of him as the creator and governor of all things, which he could not be if he were not an intelligent and sovereign spirit. Two, though angels and the souls of men are spirits, yet their excellency is only comparative, that is, they excel the best of all material beings in their nature and properties. But God, as a spirit, is infinitely more excellent than all material beings and all created spirits. Their perfections are derived from him, and therefore he is called the Father of Spirits, Hebrews 12, 9, and the God of the spirits of all flesh, Numbers 16, 22, and his perfections are underived, and he is independently immortal. Hence it is said of him that he only hath immortality. 1 Timothy 6.16. He is an infinite spirit, and it can be said of none but him that his understanding is infinite. Psalm 147, verse 5. Now a spirit is an immaterial substance, Luke 24.39, and seeing whatever God is, he is infinitely perfect in it, he is a most pure spirit. Hence we may infer, 1. That God has no body nor bodily parts. Objection. How then are eyes, ears, hands, face, and the like attributed in scripture to God? Answer. They are attributed to him not properly, but figuratively. They are spoken of him after the manner of men, in condescension to our weakness. But we are to understand them after a sort becoming the divine majesty. We are to consider what such bodily parts serve us for, as our eyes for discerning and knowing, our arms for strength, our hands for action, etc. And we are to conceive these things to be in God infinitely, which these parts serve for in us. Thus, when eyes and ears are ascribed to God, they signify his omniscience. His hands denote his power, and his face the manifestation of his love and favor. 2 that God is invisible and cannot be seen with the eyes of the body. No, not in heaven, for the glorified body is still a body, and God a spirit, which is no object of the eyes, more than sound, taste, smell, etc. 1 Timothy 1.17. 3. That God is the most suitable good to the nature of our souls, which are spirits, and can communicate himself and apply those things to them, which only can render them happy, as he is the God and Father of our spirits. 4. That it is sinful and dishonorable to God either to make images or pictures of him without us, or to have any image of him in our minds, which our unruly imagination is apt to frame to itself, especially in prayer. For God is the object of our understanding, not of our imagination. God expressly prohibited Israel to frame any similitude or resemblance of him, and tells them that they had not the least pretense for doing so, inasmuch as they saw no similitude of him when he spake to them in Horeb. Deuteronomy 4, 12, 15, and 16. And says the prophet, To whom will ye liken God, or what likeness will ye compare unto him? Isaiah 40, verse 18. We cannot form an imaginary idea of our own souls or spirits, which are absolutely invisible to us, and far less of him who is the invisible God, whom no man hath seen or can see. Therefore, to frame a picture or an idea of what is invisible is highly absurd and impracticable. Nay, it is gross idolatry, prohibited in the second commandment. 5. That externals in worship are of little value with God, who is a spirit and requires the heart. They who would be accepted of God must worship him in spirit and in truth, that is, from an apprehension and saving knowledge of what he is in Christ to poor sinners. And this saving knowledge of God in Christ is attainable in this life, for it is the matter of the divine promise. I will give them an heart to know me, that I am the Lord. Jeremiah 24, 7. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. John 6, 45. And therefore it should be most earnestly and assiduously sought after by us, as, unless we attain to it, we must perish forever. That we may know what sort of a spirit God is, we must consider his attributes, which we gather from his word and works, and that two ways. One, by denying of and removing from God in our minds all imperfection which is in the creatures, Acts 17.29. And thus we come to the knowledge of his incommunicable attributes, so-called because there is no shadow or vestige of them in the creatures, such as infinity, eternity, and unchangeableness. Two, by attributing unto him by way of eminency whatever is excellent in the creatures, seeing he is the fountain of all perfection in them, Psalm 94 verse 9. 
and thus we have his communicable attributes, whereof there are some vestiges and small scantlings in the creature, as being wisdom, power, etc., amongst which his spirituality is to be reckoned. Now both these sorts of attributes in God are not qualities in him distinct from himself, but they are God himself. God's infinity is God himself. His wisdom is himself. He is wisdom, goodness, 1 John 1, 5. Neither are these attributes so many different things in God, but they are each of them God himself. For God swears by himself, Hebrews 6, 13, yet he swears by his holiness, Amos 4, verse 2. He creates by himself, Isaiah 44, 24, yet he creates by his power, Romans 1, 20. Therefore, God's attributes are God himself. Neither are these attributes separable from one another, for though we, through weakness, must think and speak of them separately, yet they are all truly but the one infinite perfection of the divine nature, which cannot be separated therefrom without denying that he is an infinitely perfect being. We have said that God is a spirit, but angels and the souls of men are spirits too. What then is the difference between them? Why, God is an infinite, eternal, and unchangeable spirit, but angels and souls are but finite, were not from eternity, and are changeable spirits. Now these three, infinity, eternity, and immutability, are God's incommunicable attributes, which we are next to explain. First, God is infinite. Infinity is the having no bounds or limits within which a thing is contained. God then is infinite, i.e., he is whatsoever he is without bounds, limits, or measure. Job 9, 7. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? We cannot define the presence of God by any certain place, so as to say, here he is, but not there, nor by any limits, so as to say, thus far his being reacheth, and no further. But he is in every way present, after a most inconceivable manner, even in the deepest darkness and the closest recesses of privacy. He fills all the innumerable spaces that we can imagine beyond this visible world, and infinitely more than we can imagine. Now God is infinite, one, in respect of his being. For of his nature, our finite understandings cannot possibly form any adequate conception. This lies hid in rays of such bright and radiant glory as must forever dazzle the eyes of those who attempt to look into it. Two, in respect of place, and therefore he is everywhere present. Can any man hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Jeremiah 23, 24. Three, in respect of time and duration, for the ages of his eternity cannot be numbered, nor the number of his years searched out. Job 36, 26. Four, in respect of all his communicable attributes, thus the depth of his wisdom cannot be fathomed. O the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Romans 11, 33. His greatness is unsearchable. Psalm 145, verse 3. The extent of his power cannot be reached. The thunder of his power, who can understand? Job 26, 14. We cannot understand his powerful thunder, one of the lowest displays of his majesty in our region, much less the utmost extent and force of his power in its terrible effects, especially the power of his anger. God is great, and we know him not. The treasures of the divine goodness cannot be inventoried. O oh, how great is thy goodness, says the psalmist, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. The brightness of God's glory cannot be described, as a full discovery of it would quite overpower the faculties of any mortal in this imperfect state. For man is weak and unworthy of it, weak and could not bear it, guilty and could not but dread it, and therefore God holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth a cloud upon it. Job 26, 9. With what propriety, then, did he say to Moses, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Exodus 33, 20. That God is infinite is evident from the natural notions and dictates of the human mind. Hence the heathens, by the light of nature, attributed this perfection to the divine being. Thus one philosopher pronounced him to be a circle whose centre is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, which another philosopher thus expressed in clearer terms, God is included in no place and excluded from none. Which way soever ye turn, says Seneca, ye may take notice of God meeting you, for nothing is void of him. He himself fills all his works and is present with the whole creation. Remarkable also is the expression of the prince of Latin poets, Jovis Omnia Plena, all things are full of God. This also appears from several passages of scripture, as Deuteronomy 4.39, The Lord is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. 1 Kings 8.27, The heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, says Solomon in his prayer to God at the dedication of the temple. See also Psalm 139.4, etc. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. Again, if God were not infinite and immense, many gross absurdities would follow from the contrary notion, such as it is inconsistent with his universal providence over the world, by which all things are preserved. In him we live, move, and have our being, Acts 17.27. As his providence is over all, his essence must be equally diffusive. It is inconsistent with his supreme perfection. No perfection can be wanting in God, and therefore a limited essence, which is an imperfection, cannot be attributed to him. It is also inconsistent with his immutability, for if he move and recede from one place to another, would he not thereby be mutable? While yet, with him there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Last of all, it would be inconsistent with his omnipotence. That God can do everything is a notion settled in the minds of all, and his essence cannot be less or more confined than his power, and his power cannot be thought to extend farther than his essence. But some may be ready to say, does not the scripture say that God sits in heaven and dwells on high, that heaven is his throne, and does not the Lord's prayer teach us to say, our Father which art in heaven? Now, how can this agree with his infinity or immensity? I answer, God is indeed said to dwell in heaven and to dwell on high, but he is nowhere said to dwell only in the heavens. It is the court of his majestic presence, not the prison of his essence. There is a threefold presence of God, a glorious presence which is peculiar to heaven, a gracious presence which the saints enjoy on earth, and an essential presence which is equally and alike in all places. 
Others may allege that it is a disparagement to God to say that he is essentially present in all places and with all creatures, even on the dunghill of the earth and in the sordid sink of hell with the devils and the damned. To this I would only say that it is a gross misapprehension of God and an unaccountable measuring of him by ourselves to imagine that he is capable of being infected by anything below. For he is a pure and spotless being. Whatever is nauseous to our senses cannot affect him. Darkness is uncomfortable to us, but the darkness and the light are all one to him. Wickedness may hurt a man, but if we multiply our transgressions, what can we do unto him? Job 35, 6 and 8. To deny the immensity of God, says one, because of ill-centered places is to measure God rather by the nicety of sense than by the sagacity of reason. Secondly, the next incommunicable attribute of God is eternity. Hence he is called the King Eternal, 1 Timothy 1, 17. We find other things called eternal, but the eternity of all things besides God is only their having no end, though they had a beginning. Thus angels and the souls of men are eternal because they shall never have an end. The covenant of grace is eternal because the mercies of it shall last forever. The gospel is eternal because the effects of it shall never wear away. The redemption by Christ is eternal for the same reason. And the last judgment is so because the consequences will be everlasting. But the eternity of God is his being without beginning and without end. Psalm 90 verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. He was from everlasting before time and will remain unto everlasting when time shall be no more, without beginning of life or end of days. Thirdly, the next incommunicable attribute of God is unchangeableness. God is immutable, that is, always the same, without any alteration. Hence it is said, James 1.17, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. God makes changes upon the creatures, but is liable to no change himself. Though he alters his dispensations, yet not his nature, but by one pure and constant act of his will and power, affects what changes he pleases. He is the same in all his perfections, constant to his intentions, steady to his purpose, unchangeably fixed and persevering in all his decrees and resolutions. When God is said to repent in scripture, Genesis 6, 6, 1 Samuel 15, 11, it denotes only a change of his outward conduct according to his infallible foresight and immutable will. He changes the way of his providential dealings according to the carriage and deportment of his creature, without changing his will, which is the rule of his providence. For otherwise, that is an eternal truth. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. 1 Samuel 15, 29, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Having taken a short view of the incommunicable attributes of God, I proceed now to consider those that are called communicable, viz. his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now these things are in the creatures indeed, but they are in them in a finite way, but God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in these perfections, which no creature is or can be. First, there is his being, which is his nature or essence and existence, which are but one thing in God. Creatures indeed have a being, but it is only a finite being, a being that has a beginning, a changeable one, and that may have an end. But God's being is an infinite being, eternal and unchangeable. Hence he calls himself, Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. Hence we may infer, 1. That God is incomprehensible, and his essence infinite and unbounded. Psalm 145 verse 3, his greatness is unsearchable. It is not possible for a finite understanding to comprehend all that is in God, but the nature of God is a boundless ocean that hath no shore. Job 11.7, canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty to perfection? And though God perfectly knows himself, that is because his understanding is infinite. Two, God is omnipresent and immense. He is present everywhere, but bounded nowhere, not only in respect of his virtue or influence, but of his essence. This clearly appears from the following passages. Psalm 139, verse seven, eight, nine, and 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 and 24. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? 1 Kings 8, 27, Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. He is there, where the thief is stealing, the unclean person gratifying his base lusts, etc., though they see him not, and think themselves secure when no other eyes see them. 3. There is no succession in the duration of God, for where there is not a first, there cannot be a second moment of duration. But God is eternal, and there can be no succession of time in God's duration, if he be unchangeable, for that is a continual change. See 2 Peter 3, 8, One day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 4. God is independent or self-sufficient. His being and perfections are underived and not communicated to him as all finite perfections are by him to the creature. This self-existence or independence is one of the highest glories of the divine nature by which he is distinguished from all creatures who live, move and have their being in and from him. Therefore, all our springs are in him. All that we enjoy or hope for is from him and we should be entirely devoted to his service and honor. Five, lastly, this doctrine affords full breasts of consolation to the godly who have an infinite, eternal, and unchangeable friend who will never leave nor forsake them, but render them completely blessed at last and confirm them in that happy state forever. And here is unspeakable terror to those whose enemy this great and eternal God is, for being his enemies and dying in their rebellion, they shall suffer the whole vengeance and wrath threatened in his word, which he liveth forever to inflict, and he will never alter what he hath threatened. O let sinners be now persuaded to make this infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God their friend through Jesus Christ, and so they shall infallibly escape the wrath that is to come. Secondly, 
the next communicable attribute of God is wisdom. The personal wisdom of God is Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.24. But this is his essential wisdom, which is that attribute of God whereby he knows himself and all possible things and how to dispose all things to the best ends. Hence he is said to know all things, John 21.17, and to be God only wise, Romans 16.27. Now God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his wisdom. Psalm 147 verse 5, his understanding is unsearchable. The wisdom of God appears, one, in the works of creation. The universe is a bright mirror wherein the wisdom of God may be clearly seen. The Lord by wisdom made the heavens, Psalm 136 verse 5. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens, Proverbs 3.19. He hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. More particularly, the wisdom of God appears, one, in the variety of creatures which he hath made. Hence the psalmist cries out, How manifold are thy works, O Lord! In wisdom hast thou made them all, Psalm 104 verse 24. Two, in the admirable and beautiful order and situation of the creatures. God hath marshaled everything in its proper place and sphere. For instance, the sun by its position displays the infinite wisdom of its creator. It is placed in the midst of the planets to enlighten them with its brightness and inflame them with its heat and thereby derive to them such benign qualities as make them beneficial to all mixed bodies. If it were raised as high as the stars, the earth would lose its prolific virtue and remain a dead carcass for want of its quickening heat. And if it were placed as low as the moon, the air would be inflamed with its excessive heat. The waters would be dried up and every plant scorched. But at the due distance at which it is placed, it purifies the air, abates the superfluities of the waters, temperately warms the earth, and so serves all the purposes of life and vegetation. It could not be in any other position without the disorder and hurt of universal nature. Again, the expansion of the air from the ethereal heavens to the earth is another testimony of divine wisdom, for it is transparent and of a subtle nature, and so a fit medium to convey light and celestial influences to this lower world. Moreover, the situation of the earth doth also trumpet forth the infinite wisdom of its divine maker. For it is, as it were, the pavement of the world, and placed lowermost as being the heaviest body, and fit to receive the weightiest matter. 3. In fitting everything for its proper end and use, so that nothing is unprofitable and useless. After the most diligent and accurate inquiry into the works of God, there is nothing to be found superfluous, and there is nothing defective. 4. In the subordination of all its parts to one common end. Though they are of different natures, as lines vastly different in themselves, yet they all meet in one common centre, namely the good and preservation of the whole. Hosea 2, 21 and 22. I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. 2. In the government of the world. God sits in his secret place, surrounded with clouds and darkness, holding the rudder of the world in his hand, and steering its course through all the floatings and tossings of casualty and contingency to his own appointed ends. There he grasps and turns the great engine of nature, fastening one pin and loosing another, moving and removing the several wheels of it, and framing the whole according to the eternal idea of his own understanding. By his governing providence, he directs all the actions of his creatures, and by the secret and efficacious penetration of the divine influence, he powerfully sways and determines them which way he pleases. 3. In the work of redemption, this is the very masterpiece of divine wisdom, and here shines the manifold or diversified wisdom of God, Ephesians 3.10. It appears, 1. In the contrivance thereof. When man had ruined himself by sin, all the wisdom of men and angels could never have devised a method for his recovery. Heaven seemed to be divided upon this awful event. Mercy inclined to save man, but justice interposed for satisfaction. Justice pleaded the law and the curse by which the souls of sinners are forfeited to vengeance. Mercy, on the other hand, urged, shall the Almighty build a glorious work and suffer it to lie in eternal ruins? Shall the most excellent creature in the inferior world perish through the subtlety of a malicious and rebellious spirit? Shall that arch rebel triumph forever and raise his trophies from the final ruin of the works of the Most High? Shall the reasonable creature lose the fruition of God? and God lose the subjection and service of his creature, and shall all mankind be made in vain. Mercy further pleaded, that if the rigorous demands of justice be heard, it must lie an obscure and unregarded attribute in the divine essence forever, that it alone must be excluded, while all the rest of the attributes had their share of honor. Thus the case was infinitely difficult and not to be unraveled by the united wit of all the celestial spirits. A bench of angels was incapable to contrive a method of reconciling infinite mercy with inflexible justice, of satisfying the demands of the one and granting the requests of the other. In this hard exigence, the wisdom of God interposed, and in the vast treasure of its incomprehensible light, found out an admirable expedient to save man without prejudice to the other divine perfections. The pleas of justice, said the wisdom of God, shall be satisfied in punishing, and the requests of mercy shall be granted in pardoning. Justice shall not complain for want of punishment, nor mercy for want of compassion. I will have an infinite sacrifice to contend justice, and the virtue and fruit of that sacrifice shall delight mercy. Here justice shall have punishment to accept, and mercy shall have pardon to bestow. My son shall die and satisfy justice by his death, and by the virtue and merit of that sacrifice, sinners shall be received into favor, and herein mercy shall triumph and be glorified. Here was the most glorious display of wisdom. 2. In the ordination of a mediator, every way fitly qualified to reconcile men unto God. A mediator must be capable of the sentiments and affections of both the parties he is to reconcile, and a just esteemer of the rights and injuries of the one and the other, and to have a common interest in both. 
The Son of God, by his incarnation, perfectly possesses all these qualities. He hath a nature to please God, and a nature to please sinners. He had both the perfections of the deity, and all the qualities and sinless infirmities of the humanity. The one fitted him for things pertaining to God, and the other furnished him with a sense of the infirmities of man. This union of the divine and human nature in the person of Christ was necessary to fit and qualify him for the discharge of his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. As a prophet it was requisite he should be God, that so he might acquaint us with his Father's will, and reveal the secret purposes and hidden counsels of heaven concerning our salvation, which were locked up in the bosom of God from all eternity. And it was needful he should be man, that he might converse with poor sinners in a familiar manner, and convey the mind and counsels of God to them in such a way as they could receive them. As a priest, he behoved to be a man, that so he might be capable to suffer and to bear the wrath which the sins of the elect had justly deserved. And it behoved him to be God, to render his temporary sufferings satisfactory. The great dignity and excellency of the divine mediator's person made his sufferings of infinite value in God's account. Though he only suffered as a man, yet he satisfied as God. As a king, he must be God to conquer Satan, convert an elect world, and effectually subdue the lusts and corruptions of men. And he must be man, that by the excellency of his example, he might lead us in the way of life. 3. In the manner whereby this redemption is accomplished, namely by the humiliation of the Son of God. By this he counteracted the sin of angels and men. Pride is the poison of every sin, for in every transgression the creature prefers his pleasure to, and sets up his own will above, God's. This was the special sin of Adam. The devil would have leveled heaven by an unpardonable usurpation. He said in his heart, I will be like the Most High, and man infected with his breath, when he said, he shall be like God's, became sick of the same disease. Now the divine Redeemer, that he might cure our disease in its source and cause by the quality of the remedy, applied to our pride and unspeakable humility. Man was guilty of the highest robbery in affecting to be equal with God, and the Son, who was in the bosom of God and equal to him in majesty and authority, emptied himself by assuming the human nature in its servile state. Philippians 2, 6, 7, and 8. It is said, John 1, 14, the Word was made flesh. The meanest part of our nature is specified to signify the greatness of his abasement. There is such an infinite distance between God and flesh that the condescension is as admirable as the contrivance. So great was the malignity of human pride that such a profound humility was requisite for the cure of it. And by this Christ destroyed the works of the devil. 4. In appointing such contemptible and in appearance opposite means to bring about such glorious effects. The way is as admirable as the work. Christ ruined the devil's empire by the very same nature that he had vanquished, and by the very means which he had made use of to establish and confirm it. He took not upon him the nature of angels, which is equal to Satan in strength and power, but he took part of flesh and blood, that he might the more signally triumph over the proud spirit in the human nature, which was inferior to his, and had been vanquished by him in paradise. For this end he did not immediately exercise omnipotent power to destroy him, but managed our weakness to foil the roaring lion. He did not enter the lists with Satan in the glory of his deity, but disguised under human nature, which was subject to mortality. And thus the devil was overcome in the same nature over which he first got the victory. For, as the whole race of mankind was captivated by him in Adam the representative, so believers are made victorious over him by the conquest which their representative obtained in the whole course of his sufferings. As our ruin was affected by the subtlety of Satan, so our recovery is wrought by the wisdom of God, who takes the wise in their own craftiness. Thus eternal life springs from death, glory from ignominy, and blessedness from a curse. We are healed by stripes, quickened by death, purchased by blood, crowned by a cross, advanced to the highest honor by the lowest humility, comforted by sorrows, glorified by disgrace, absolved by condemnation, and made rich by poverty. Thus the wisdom of God shines with a radiant brightness in the work of redemption. I shall conclude at this point with a few inferences. 1. God is omniscient. He knows all things. John 21, 17. All things are naked and open to him. Hebrews 4, 18. His eye sees us wherever we are. Even future contingencies as well as the most necessary things are known to him. This is beautifully described by the psalmist. Psalm 139, 1-10, which deserves your serious perusal. 2. His knowledge of all things is not conjectural, but infallible. Romans 11, 33 and 34. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor? There is nothing to him contingent or uncertain, but everything falls out exactly according to his foreknowledge and predetermination. 3. It is altogether independent on the creature, whose motions and operations were known to him from eternity, and are all regulated by his counsel. 4. Lastly, to this wise God we may safely entrust all our concerns, knowing he will manage them all so as to promote his own glory and our real good. Thirdly, the next communicable perfection of God is power, whereby he can do whatever he pleases, and whatsoever is not repugnant to his nature. Jeremiah 32, 17. Our Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in power, which the scripture holds forth. 1. Positively, Genesis 17, 1. I am the Almighty God. 2. Negatively, Luke 1, 37, with God nothing shall be impossible. 3. Comparatively, Matthew 19, 26, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The power of God appears, 1. In the creation of the world, Romans 1, 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Oh, how great must that power be which produced the beautiful fabric of the universe without the concurrence of any material cause. This proclaims it to be truly infinite, for nothing less could make such distant extremes as nothing and being to meet together. 
All this was done by a word, one simple act of his will, for he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. Psalm 33, 9. 2. In the preservation of the world, and all things therein. He upholdeth all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1, 3. He preserves all the creatures in their proper place for their proper end and use. It is by the divine power that the heavenly bodies have constantly rolled about in their spheres for so many ages, without wearing or moving out of their proper course, and that the tumultuous elements have persisted in their order to this very day. He preserves the confederacies of nature, sets bounds to the raging sea, and keeps it within its limits by a girdle of sand. He is the powerful preserver of man and beast. He preserves them in their kind and species by the constant succession of them, one after another, so that, though the individuals perish, yet the species continues. Oh, what a mighty power must that be that sustains so many creatures, sets bounds to the raging sea, holds the winds in his fist, and preserves a comely order and sweet harmony among all the creatures. 3. In the government of the world. He is the supreme rector of the universe and manages all things so that they contribute to the advancement of his own glory and the advantage of his people. By his governing providence, he directs all the actions and motions of his creatures and powerfully determines them which way soever he pleases. All the creatures are called his host because he marshals them as an army to serve his important purposes. The whole system of nature is ready to favor and act for men when he commands it and is ready to punish them when he gives it a commission. Thus he checked the Red Sea and it obeyed his voice. Psalm 106.9 its rapid motion quickly ceased, and the fluid waters were immediately ranged as defensive walls to secure the march of his people. At the command of God, the sea again recovered its wonted violence, and the watery walls came tumbling down upon the heads of the proud Egyptian oppressor and his host. The sea so exactly obeyed its orders that not one Israelite was drowned, and not one Egyptian was saved alive. More particularly, the power of God appears in the moral government of the world. One, in governing and ordering the hearts of men, so that they are not masters of their own affections, but often act quite contrary to what they have firmly resolved and purposed, of which we have eminent instances in Esau and Balaam. He hath the hearts of all men in his hands, and can turn them what way he pleases. Thus he bent the hearts of the Egyptians to favor the Israelites, by sending them away with great riches given them by way of loan. He turned Jehoshaphat's enemies from him when he came with a purpose to destroy him. 2 Chronicles 18.31 2. In governing and managing the most stubborn creatures as devils and wicked men. 1. In his governing devils, they have great power and are full of malice. The devil is always going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We could have no quiet nor safety in the world if his power were not restrained and his malice curbed by one that is mightier than the infernal fiend. He would turn all things topsy-turvy, plague the world, burn cities and houses, and plunder us of all the supports of life, if he were not held in a chain by the omnipotent governor of the world. But God overmasters his strength, so that he cannot move one hair's breadth beyond his tether. God has all the devils chained, and he governs all their motions. The devil could not touch Job in his person and goods without the divine permission, nor could he enter into the Gadarene swine without a special license. If we consider the great malice of these invisible enemies and the vast extent of their power, we will easily see that there could be no safety or security for men if they were not curbed and restrained by a superior power. 2. In governing wicked men, all the imaginations of their hearts are evil, and only evil continually. They are fully bent upon mischief and drink iniquity like water. What unbridled licentiousness and headstrong fury would triumph in the world and run with a rapid violence if the divine power did not interpose to bear down the floodgates of it? Human society would be rooted up, the whole world drenched in blood, and all things would run into a sea of confusion if God did not bridle and restrain the lusts and corruptions of men. The king of Assyria triumphed much in his design against Jerusalem, but how did God govern and manage that wild ass? Isaiah 37, 29, I will put my hook into thy nose, says Jehovah, and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. And we are told, Psalm 76, 10, that the very wrath of man shall praise him, and that he will restrain the remainder of wrath. 3. In raising up a church to himself in spite of all his enemies. This is especially seen in founding the New Testament church and propagating the gospel through the world. The power of God appears admirable in planting the gospel and converting the world to Christianity. For there were many and great difficulties in the way, as gross and execrable idolatry, and the nations were strongly confirmed and rooted in their idolatry, being trained up and inured to it from their infant state. It was as hard to make the Gentiles forsake religion, which they received from their birth, as to make the Africans change their skin and the leopard his spots. The pagan religion was derived from their progenitors through a long succession of ages. Hence the heathens accused the Christian religion of novelty and urged nothing more plausibly than the argument of immemorial prescription for their superstition. They would not consider whether it was just and reasonable, but with a blind deference yielded up themselves to the authority of the ancients. The pomp of the pagan worship was very pleasing to the flesh. The magnificence of their temples, adorned with the trophies of superstition and their mysterious ceremonies, their music, their processions, their images and altars, their sacrifices and purifications, and the rest of the equipage of a carnal religion drew their respects and strongly affected their minds through their senses. Whereas the religion of the gospel is spiritual and serious, holy and pure, and hath nothing to move the carnal part. There was then an universal deprivation of manners among men. The whole earth was covered with abominations. The most unnatural lusts had lost the fear and shame that naturally attends them. We may see a melancholy picture of their most abandoned conversation, Romans 1. The powers of the world were bent against the gospel. The heathen philosophers strongly opposed it. When Paul preached at Athens, the Epicureans and Stoics entertained him with scorn and derision. What will this babbler say, said they, 
The heathen priests conspired to obstruct it. The princes of the world thought themselves obliged to prevent the introduction of a new religion, lest their empire should be in hazard, or the greatness and majesty of it impaired thereby. If we consider the means by which the gospel was propagated, the divine power will evidently appear. The persons employed in this great work were a few illiterate fishermen, with a publican and a tent maker, without authority and power to force men to obedience, and without the charms of eloquence to enforce the belief of the doctrines which they taught. Yet this doctrine prevailed, and the gospel had wonderful success through all the parts of the then known world, and that against all the power and policy of men and devils. Now, how could this possibly be without a mighty operation of the power of God upon the hearts of men? For, in preserving, defending, and supporting his church under the most terrible tempests of trouble and persecution which were raised against her, this is promised by our blessed Saviour, Matthew 16, verse 18, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The most flourishing monarchies have decayed and wasted, and the strongest kingdoms have been broken in pieces, yet the church has been preserved to this very day, notwithstanding all these subtle and potent enemies which in all ages have been pushing at her. Yea, God has preserved and delivered his church in the greatest extremities, when the danger in all human appearances was unavoidable, as in Egypt, at the Red Sea, and in Esther's days, when a bloody decree was issued to slay all the Jews. Yea, God hath sometimes delivered his church by very weak and contemptible-like instruments, such as Moses, a fugitive from Egypt, and Aaron, a poor captive in it, and sometimes by very unlikely means, as when he smote Egypt with armies of locusts and lice. In all ages of the world, God has gloriously displayed his power in the preservation of his church and people, notwithstanding all the rage, power, and malice of their enemies. By in the conversion of the elect, Hence the gospel, which is the means and instrument of conversion, is called the power of God and the rod of his strength, and the day of the success of the gospel in turning sinners to Christ is called the day of his power. Psalm 110 verse 3. Oh, what a mighty power must that be that stills the waves of a tempestuous sea, quells the lusts and stubbornness of the heart, demolishes the strongholds of sin in the soul, routs all the armies of corrupt nature, and makes the obstinate rebellious will strike sail to Christ. The power of God that is exerted here makes a man to think on other objects and speak in another strain than he did before. Oh, how admirable is it that carnal reason should be thus silenced, that legions of devils should be thus driven out, and that men should part with those sins which before they esteemed their chiefest ornaments, and stand at defiance with all the charming allurements and the bitter discouragements of the world. The same power that raised Christ from the grave is exerted in the conversion of a sinner, Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. There is greater power exerted in this case than there was in the creation of the world. For when God made the world, he made with no opposition. He spake the word, and it was done. But when he comes to convert a sinner, he meets with all the opposition which the devil and the corrupt heart can make against him. God wrought but one miracle in the creation, he spake the word and it was done. But there are many miracles wrought in conversion, the blind is made to see, the dead raised, and the deaf hears the voice of the Son of God. Oh, the infinite power of Jehovah! In this work the mighty arm of the Lord is revealed. 6. In preserving the souls of believers amidst the many dangers to which they are exposed, and bringing them safely to glory at last. They have many enemies without, a legion of subtle and powerful devils, and a wicked and ensnaring world with all its allurements and temptations, and they have many strong lusts and corruptions within, and their graces are but weak, and in their infancy and minority, while they are here so that it may justly be matter of wonder how they are preserved. But the Apostle tells us that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. 1 Peter 1 verse 5. Indwelling corruption would soon quench grace in their hearts, if it were not kept alive by a divine power. But Christ hath pledged his faithfulness for it, that they shall be kept secure. John 10 verse 28. It is his power that moderates the violence of temptations, supports his people under them, defeats the power of Satan, and bruises him under their feet. 4. Lastly, the power of God appears gloriously in the redemption of sinners by Jesus Christ. Hence in Scripture Christ is called the power as well as the wisdom of God. This is the most admirable work that ever God brought forth in the world. More particularly, one, the power of God shines in Christ's miraculous conception in the womb of a virgin. The power of the highest did overshadow her, Luke 1 verse 35, and by a creative act framed the humanity of Christ and the substance of the virgin's body, and united it to the divinity. This was foretold many years before as the effect of the divine power. When Judah was oppressed by two potent kings and despaired of any escape and deliverance to raise their drooping spirits, the prophet tells them that he would give them a sign, and a wonderful one it was. Therefore it is said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7 verse 14. The argument is from the greater to the less. For if God will accomplish that stupendous and unheard of wonder, much more will he rescue his people from the fury of their adversaries. 2. In uniting the divine and human nature in the person of Christ, and that without any confusion of the two natures or changing the one into the other. The two natures of Christ are not mixed together as liquors that incorporate with one another when poured into the same vessel. The divine nature is not turned into the human, nor the human into the divine. One nature doth not swallow up another and make a food distinct from both, but they are distinct and yet united, conjoined and yet unmixed. The properties of each nature are preserved entire. Oh, what a wonder of power was here, that two natures, a divine and a human, infinitely distant in themselves, should meet together in a personal conjunction. Here one equal with God is found in the form of a servant. Here God and man are united in one. The creator and the creature are miraculously allied in the same subsistence. Here a God of unmixed blessedness is linked personally with a man of perpetual sorrows. That is an admirable expression, the word was made flesh. John 1 verse 14. What can be more miraculous than for God to become man and man to become God? That a person possessed of all the perfections and excellencies of the deity should inherit all the infirmities and imperfections of humanity, sin only accepted. Was there not need of infinite power to bring together terms which were so far asunder? Nothing less than an omnipotent power could effect and bring about what an infinite and incomprehensible wisdom it projected in this matter. 
3. In supporting the human nature of Christ and keeping it from sinking under the terrible weight of divine wrath that came upon him for our sins, and making him victorious over the devil and all the powers of darkness. His human nature could not possibly have borne up under the wrath of God and the curse of the law, nor held out under such fearful contests with the powers of hell and the world, if it had not been upheld by infinite power. Hence his father says concerning him, Isaiah 42 verse 1, Behold my servant whom I uphold. 4. The divine power did evidently appear in raising Christ from the dead. The apostle tells us that God exerted his mighty power in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Ephesians 1 verse 19. The unlocking the belly of the whale for the deliverance of Jonah, the rescue of Daniel from the den of lions, and restraining the fire from burning the three children were signal declarations of the divine power and types of the resurrection of our Redeemer. But all these are nothing to what is represented by them, for that was a power over natural causes and curbing of beasts and restraining of elements. But in the resurrection of Christ, God exercised a power over himself and quenched the flames of his own wrath that was hotter than millions of Nebuchadnezzar's furnaces. He unlocked the prison doors wherein the curses of the law had lodged our Savior, stronger than the belly and ribs of a Leviathan. How admirable was it that he should be raised from under the curse of the law and the infinite weight of our sins and brought forth with success and glory after his sharp encounter with the powers of hell. In this, the power of God was gloriously manifested. Hence he is said to be raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, i.e. by his glorious power, and declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1 verse 4. All the miraculous proofs by which God acknowledged him for his son during his life had been ineffectual without this. If he had remained in the grave, it had been reasonable to believe him only an ordinary person, and that his death had been the just punishment of his presumption in calling himself the Son of God. But his resurrection from the dead was the most illustrious and convincing evidence that really he was what he declared himself to be. I shall conclude on this point with a few inferences. 1. God is omnipotent, that is, can do all things. It is true he cannot lie nor deny himself, for these are repugnant to his nature, and argue not power but weakness and imperfection. 2. God's power never acts to its utmost extent. He can do more always than he either doth or will do. Matthew 3 verse 9. He can do all things possible, but he only doth what he has decreed to be done. Matthew 26 verses 53 and 54. 3. Hence we may be confirmed in our belief of the resurrection. Some are ready to reckon it a thing impossible that there can be a recollection of the dispersed particles of men's bodies when they are dissolved into dust and scattered into the four winds. But if we consider the power of God, this will abundantly answer all that can be objected against this truth. Hence saith the Apostle, Acts 26 verse 8, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And saith our Saviour to the Sadducees who deny the resurrection, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Almighty power can meet with no let or bar, unless the particles of men's bodies could be scattered beyond the reach of Almighty power, and grinded so small as to escape the knowledge and care of God. This dispersion can make nothing against the faith and possibility of the resurrection. 4. Is God of infinite power? Then all his promises shall be most certainly accomplished, whatever difficulties may be in the way thereof. For God is able to bring to pass whatever he has promised to his people. Therefore difficulty or improbability should never discourage or weaken our faith, because the power of God is infinite. 5. They are absolutely sure of salvation, who are kept by the power of God. For God is able to keep them from falling, and his power is engaged for their preservation. They are surrounded with and enfolded in the arms of omnipotence. Their souls are in safe custody, being committed unto Christ, from whose hands none can pluck them. 6. Woe to those against whom the power of God is set, for they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Consider this, O ye sinners, and flee from the wrath that is to come. 7. Abuse not the power of God by limiting it, as Israel did in the wilderness. Psalm 78 verse 19. By trusting to an arm of flesh, as too many are apt to do, more than to the God of power. Jeremiah 17 verse 5. Or by fearing the wrath of man, who can only kill the body and not dreading the displeasure of Almighty God. Isaiah 51 verses 12 and 13. 8. Lastly, improve the power of God by faith, depending upon it for the performance of all his gracious promises towards you and the church, for he can work and who shall let it, for strength to resist and vanquish sin, Satan, and the world, saying, If God be for us, who can be against us? And for grace to enable you to the performance of every command of duty, saying with the apostle, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing our content. We would also by made length satisfy your request, which in my opinion is not so necessary, if it would please you to read Dr. Biza and Peter Mata on this question, whereunto I think you were before directed by me. Hereby also I would give you to understand that hitherto I have rather wanted ability than will to gratify you. Of you let me entreat this courtesy that you do not by disputation trouble others who either will not hear aught besides that which they have before conceived, or cannot readily understand those things whereof they never thought before, and have in their infancy learned false instead of true principles and foundations. And were I not fully persuaded that in this question you would frame yourself to Christian wisdom and patient forbearance of the weaker sort, I would not answer one word to your demand. The doctrine of predestination is not, in my judgment, as you write, the most difficult point in all Christianity, if we read Holy Scripture without prejudice or affection, and with serious purpose, not to reform God after our fantasies, but to learn of him, and to yield all glory unto him and none to ourselves. For by these means that is now become easy to me, which before seemed very difficult, whilst I depended on the authority of men, who never understood themselves nor could resolve me. There is no one common place of divinity whereof more is written by the prophets and apostles than this very place of providence, election, and free will, insomuch that I cannot but marvel learned Christians can so doubt thereof. Do you, as I have done, who for this only reason, that I might gather, weigh, and conference whatsoever is contained as well in sermons as examples of Holy Scripture to this purpose, have diligently perused the whole Bible, even from the beginning of Genesis to the end of the Revelation, which after I had done, 
I did partly perceive and partly detest that scum of disputation and foggy fume of fallacy and sophistry, laboring to no purpose to eclipse the glorious sunshine of this doctrine. You may at your better leisure do this in Italy, where you shall have no exercise of religion besides reading the Bible and private prayer, which liberty some very good men heretofore have wanted, who otherwise had never been so entangled. But ever bear this in mind, whereof before I warned you. If for the present everything be not plain and easy to you, be not therefore troubled, but by leisure, diligently meditate with yourself calling upon God, and holding that foundation which amongst the godly is without controversy, remembering always that not yourself but God is author of your salvation, and of all besides whatsoever you are, have or do, be it great or little. So shall you be sure not to err with any danger of conscience and salvation, although you be not able to conceive and unfold whatsoever you desire. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. First you must put a difference between providence and predestination, as between the whole and the part. For providence is the eternal, immutable, and most excellent counsel or decree of God, whereby all things have their event tending to the glory of the Creator and salvation of the elect. Predestination is the eternal purpose of God, of beginning and perfecting the salvation of the elect, and forsaking or utter casting off the reprobate to eternal punishment, wherefore it containeth election and reprobation as parts of itself. Secondly, distinguish betwixt providence of good and evil of offence, for the evil of punishment hath a reference to good, namely to justice, and in that respect is found in God. God doth provide that is in his providence, purpose, and will perform in purposed time, order, and manner, and in this respect he is said to be the cause, efficient, and author of things. These things are not only done according to providence, but also by the providence of God. For as evil or sin that he foreseeth from eternity, that is, he decreeth or is willing to permit it, or not to hinder others from doing it, but himself is in no wise an agent, either in them or by them. Wherefore himself is not the cause of evil, but injustice, excellency, and depth of wisdom he suffereth others to be the causes thereof. So that these things are done according to God's providence, but not by it, because God did not decree to do, but to suffer others to do them. Now to permit or suffer is nothing else, but not to hinder sin in any action, or not to cause men to be conformable to the law of God and nature. And in this sense, God doth tolerate or suffer sin, when he doth not either lighten our minds with his Holy Spirit and knowledge of his will, or turn our hearts to make this the principal end of our actions, that we do the known will of God, and by this our obedience honor him. Which two things, except it please God to work in us, whatever we do, how good, just, and holy soever, it is but sin and corruption in the sight of God. Thirdly, make a distinction between God and his creatures, or second causes, especially in matters concerning the government of the world. First, the creatures are bound, one, to further the safety and hinder the destruction of another, wheresoever they can, because God hath so commanded all, and themselves may deserve it one of another. And being converted thyself, remember to confirm thy brethren. God is bound to none, as not to create them of nothing, so neither to preserve them, either in their being, or in that good, innocent, and happy being wherein they were created. Because whatsoever good we all enjoy, we have it from him, neither can he receive any good, felicity, and commodity of any man, because of his infinite and most absolute all-sufficiency in himself, who hath given unto him first that he should be recompensed. Is it not lawful for me to do with mine own as pleaseth me? Secondly, God's justice requireth that being himself the chiefest good and order and end of all things, he should refer all to his own glory, and if need were, rather suffer all the creatures of the world to perish, than any part of his glory should be left unsatisfied. As for the creatures, they owe both themselves and all they have, not to themselves nor to others but to God. Therefore Paul desired even to be accursed from Christ, if by the salvation and conversion of his brethren he might advance the glory of Christ. Thirdly, God may therefore most justly permit and tolerate the sins of his creatures, that is, not hinder them, because by his infinite wisdom, power, justice, and goodness, he knoweth how to use this toleration and permission to his own glory and the salvation of his elect. This the creatures cannot do, and therefore they are subject to the law of hindering offences as much as in them lieth. Fourthly, God is the first cause and author of all good in the world. The creatures are only instruments of such good things as are by them performed, whom God, in the absolute freedom of his excellent will and pleasure, useth, and by his providence preserveth in that nature and manner of doing which he hath prescribed. Fifthly, God alone is simply immutable. I am God, and am not changed. All creatures are mutable, some of their own nature, which work only by uncertainty. Here there is a lacuna in the text. The unstable action of elements, matter, and motion of creatures, or by uncertainty or contingency, and yet freely too, as the wills of angels, and here there is a lacuna in the text are indeed of their own immutable and therefore necessary agents in that which they do, yet are as easy to be altered by God as the rest. So the motion of the sun is naturally such as we see, yet God at his pleasure can either stop or interrupt the course thereof. Sixthly, God alone is simply and absolutely free, that is of himself moving all things, in himself moved and depending of none, having himself the reason and cause of all his purposes, with greatest power and authority of disposing all things otherwise from eternity, if so he had been pleased, imposing necessity or contingence and uncertainty upon all things, himself not tied to such conditions by anything. Ephesians 1 verse 9, according to his good pleasure, he had purposed in himself. But the liberty of reasonable creatures is not absolute, that is, depending of no other. For although they move themselves by some internal cause, understanding, offering some object and will of his own accord without constraint, choosing or refusing it, yet are they overruled by another agent, namely God, who both offereth objects of what nature and quality, howsoever and to whomsoever it pleaseth him, and also to them and by them affecteth, moveth, inclineth, and boweth the wills of whomsoever, whensoever, and how far soever he will himself. That man's conceit of God is too contumulous, which putteth no difference between the liberty which is in God and his creatures. Wherefore God's providence and working in all things doth not destroy, but uphold and increase the liberty of our wills. For the more God moveth or forsaketh them, the more violently and consequently with more freedom and fervency of desire they are carried either to good or evil. 
Wherefore then, indeed, we shall with greatest freedom will that which is good when God shall so be all in all, that we can will or wish nothing but what is good, which shall be with the favour and grace of God in the life to come. Fourthly, we must distinguish the manner of effects or things done. For the same effect proceeding from diverse causes may in respect of them be diversely taken. For as it proceedeth from a good cause, so it is good. As from an evil, so evil. As from a cause contingent and mutable, or necessary and immutable, so may it be accounted contingent and mutable, or necessary and immutable. Wherefore, in respect of God, in whom we have our being, life, and motion, all things which were made are good, as well as bad as good. Considering that God is absolutely and immutably good, and therefore can neither will nor do anything but what is good and agreeable to his nature, and the law wherein he hath revealed unto us his nature and justice. In respect of creatures, all good things, as they are good, are by God upheld in their goodness. All evil things, as they are evil, degenerate from that goodness wherein they were created, are not suffering and forsaking them, and are not thereunto restored by God. So in respect of the liberty and freedom of God, all things are done contingently and by uncertainty, yea, even those things which seem to depend most necessarily on second causes, as the motion of the heavens. But in respect of God's immutable decree, all events are necessary, as when the soldiers crucifying Christ did not break his bones, but pierced his side with a spear, which in respect of second causes were merely contingent. Fifthly, we make distinction of sins, whereof some in themselves and in their own nature are sins, namely such things as are forbidden by God, nor are by special law or exception commanded, as the robbing of the Egyptians, the offering of Isaac, others by occasion or accident, namely such things as are either commanded or allowed by God, but perverted by the creature, and not performed in such sort as they were commanded, as are the sacrifices, prayers, and alms deeds of wicked men and hypocrites. Whether of these two sorts of sin a man commit, either that which is sin in itself, or the other which is sin by accident and occasion, certain it is that through his own fault and imperfection he committeth it. But that which God intendeth in these actions of men is ever good and just. Lastly, we must distinguish the necessity of constraint and immutability, for it were too gross to confound them. For the former moveth violently and by external cause, the latter naturally, some internal cause in the agent moving and being moved, as by nature it is apt. These things, when I perceived God opening my eyes, I did not reckon one mote of those foolish fables, that God was made the cause of sin, that contingents or causality and liberty were taken away. And all this I learned out of infinite places of scriptures. As Genesis 20, therefore have I kept thee, that thou shouldst not sin against me, nor did I suffer thee to touch her. Genesis 45, God sent me before you for your safety. And again, I was not sent hither by your purpose, but by the will of God, who hath made me, as it were, a father unto Pharaoh. Genesis 50, fear not, can we resist God's will? You fought evil against me, but God turned it to good, that he might exalt me, as you now see and preserve many people. Exodus 4, 7, 10, 11, and 14. I will harden the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants, and I will show my wonders in the land of Egypt. And in the ninth chapter, therefore have I placed thee in the kingdom, that I might show my power in thee, and my name might be declared in all the world. Exodus 12. God gave his people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent jewels unto them, and they wronged the Egyptians. Exodus 21. If a man hath not laid wait for him whom he hath slain, but God hath given him into his hands, which he speaketh of murder done by misfortune or chance. Exodus 22. Every man slay his brother, his friend, and his neighbor. They which did this are commended, who without this commandment had done very evil, yet had not gone so commanded them, but upon some other occasion provoked their minds thereunto, he might as justly have punished those idolaters by sinning instruments, as he did by these just executioners of his judgment, because they were not governed by secret providence, but by the manifest and open will of God. Exodus 33. I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Numbers 23. God is not as man that he should be, or as the son of man that he should be changed. Hath he therefore said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall it not be fulfilled? I am sent to... Here, there is a lacuna in the text. I cannot forbid a blessing. Deuteronomy 5. Oh, that there were in them such a heart to fear me, and ever to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their children forever. By these and the like places God showeth what he liketh, wherein he is delighted, and what pleaseth him. But by Exodus 33, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and the like, he showeth what he will effect or bring to pass amongst men, and in whom. Deuteronomy 13, if a prophet shall say, let us go and follow strange gods. Here, there is a lacuna in the text. Do his voice, because the Lord tempteth you, that it may appear whether you love him or no. And in the same place, let the prophet be slain, because he hath spoken to turn you from the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 29, and God gave you not an understanding heart, even until this day. Joshua 11, here, there is a lacuna in the text. Please God, you harden, then he, here, there is a lacuna in the text that they should fight against Israel and be overthrown, and should not find mercy but perish, as God had commanded Moses. Judges, chapters 2 and 3, God forsook the nations which he commanded to be rooted out. 1 Samuel 2, they did not hearken to the voice of their father, because God would slay them. And in the same book, the tenth chapter, part of the house went with him, whose hearts God had touched. And again, 10, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit of the Lord, or from the Lord, did vex him. Second of Samuel, chapter 12, Behold, I will stir up evil against thee from thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thy face, and give them to thy neighbor, and thy son shall be with thy wives openly. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, and in the sight of the sun. And chapter 17, the counsel of Ahithophel is overthrown by the Lord's countenance. And chapter 24, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against Israel, he moved David to say unto Joab, etc. 1 Chronicles 21, Satan rose up against Israel, and provoked David to number the people. 2 Samuel 22, and 2 Chronicles 10, Rehoboam suffered not the people to be at rest, for it was God's will. 
And 1 Chronicles 11, this is done by my will. 1 Kings 22, God gave the spirit of lying. 2 Chronicles 36, God stirred up the heart of Cyrus. Ezra, chapter 6, God had turned the king's heart unto them. Job chapter 1, the Lord hath given and the Lord hath taken away. Job chapter 12, he bringeth counselors to a foolish end. Job chapter 14, thou hast appointed the bounds thereof which cannot be passed. Psalm 105, he turned their hearts to hate his people. Psalm 115, he hath done whatsoever he would. Psalm 16, the Lord hath made all things for his own sake, even the wicked for the day of evil. Verse 3, the lot is cast into the lap, but behold his position hereof is of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 21, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand, he turneth it as rivers of water. Whether, here there is a lacuna in the text. Ecclesiastes, the seventh, consider the works of the Lord, that none can amend him whom he hath disposed. Wisdom 8, wisdom reacheth from one end to another, she hath disposed all things mightily and orderly. Read the twelfth and nineteenth chapters of the same book, and Sirach. 17. They cannot make their hearts of stone to become fleshly. Isaiah 10. O oh, Ashur, the rod of my wrath, etc. In his hand is my indignation. I will send him to a dissembling nation that shall take thee. Here, there is a lacuna in the text of them. Read the whole place which alone sufficeth to repel that objection of the cause of sin. Like places are found in the 13th chapter. And Isaiah 14. The Lord of hosts hath decreed, and who can alter it? Isaiah 43. Everyone that calleth on the name of the Lord. Him have I created for my glory. Him have I fashioned. Him have I made. And in the same place, I will bring it to pass, and who shall withstand it? Isaiah 45, I am the Lord, making peace and creating evil. And the 46th chapter, my determination shall stand, etc. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have proposed, and will do it. Jeremiah 13, if the Ethiopian can change his skin or the leopard his spots, you also will be able to do well, having learned to do ill. Jeremiah 30, God hath opened his treasury, and brought forth vessels of his wrath. Lamentations 3, who is he that saith, and it cometh to pass, and the Lord commandeth. Here yeah, there is a lacuna in the text. Doth not evil and good proceed out of the mouth of the Lord most high? Ezekiel 12, I will speak a word, and bring it to pass. Ezekiel 14, when a prophet hath cried and spoken aught amiss, I the Lord have deceived that prophet. Ezekiel 18, I will not the death of him that dieth. Much like that, Deuteronomy 5, O oh, that word to them, etc. As above hath been said, Ezekiel 20, I gave them commandments which were not good. Ezekiel 29, Nebuchadnezzar my servant caused his army to serve a great servitude against Cyrus. Ezekiel 36, and I will give you a new heart and good a new spirit in the midst of you, and I will take away this stony heart from your flesh. Compare the 17th of Sirach and Jeremiah 13 and Ezekiel 58, I will lead thee about and put a bridle in thy mouth and bring thee forth. And that day shall many things come to thy mind, and thou shalt think evil thoughts, and shalt say, I will go up to the land, etc. Compare this with Isaiah 10, Daniel 4. He worketh according to his will, both in the armies of heaven, and also in the habitations of the earth. And there is none can stain his hand, or say unto him, Why hast thou done this? Amos 3. There is no evil in the city which the Lord hath not done, which is spoken of the evil of punishment, though oftentimes it fall out by accident, that there be also an evil of offense, which God suffereth to concur. Micah 4. Many nations are gathered together, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord. Matthew 7, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and in the same chapter, they which are built upon a rock shall not fall. Read Melanchthon's commentary upon that place. Luke 10, one sparrow falleth not to the ground. Matthew 11, I thank thee, Father, for thou hast hidden these things from the wise. Matthew 13, to you it is given to know, but unto others it is not given. Matthew 16, and everywhere in the evangelists, that Christ ought to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Matthew 18, it is necessary that offenses should come. Matthew 20, is it not lawful for me to do with mine own what I will? Many are called, but few be chosen. Matthew 24, all things must come to pass. And in the same place, it is not possible that the elect should err finally. John 6, whatsoever my Father hath given me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me I will not cast forth. And no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. And this is the will of my Father, that of all whatsoever he hath given me I should lose nothing. John 10, other sheep also I have, which I must bring unto my flock. And my sheep no man taketh out of my hand. John 11, Caiaphas, when he was high priest, did prophesy. John 12, therefore they could not believe, because he had blinded their eyes. John 13, I know them whom I have chosen. John 14, which spirit the world cannot receive. John 15, you have not chosen me, but I you. Acts 1, the prophecies concerning Judas which have been fulfilled. Acts 2, him have you taken by the hands of the wicked, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, who have crucified and slain. Acts 3, through ignorance he did it, but God so fulfilled the things which he had foretold. Acts 4, they came together to do whatsoever thy hand and counsel had before decreed to be done. Acts 13, they believed as many as were ordained to eternal life. Acts 17, he giveth life and motion unto all things, and in him we live, move, and have our being. Romans 1, God delivered him over to a reprobate mind. Romans 8, all things work for the good of those that love God. Romans 9, he hath mercy on whom he will, and hardeneth whom he will. Read, here there is a lacuna in the text. Hold this petition. Romans 11, election prevailed, the rest are hardened, and the graces of God are without repentance. 1 Corinthians 4, what hast thou, but thou hast not received? Ephesians 1, he hath chosen us in himself before the creation of the world, that he may be. Here there is a lacuna in the text and predestinated according to his purpose, who doth. Here, there is a lacuna in the text. The counsel of his own will. Read the chapter itself. Philippians 1, it is God which worketh in us both to will and to perform of his near good will. 2 Thessalonians 2, here, there is a lacuna in the text. 
Strong errors amongst them. Perused the place to defeat two. The foundation of the Lord standeth sure. 1 John 2, they went out from amongst us, but were not of us. 1 John 4, herein appeareth his love, in that he loved us first. Revelation 17, God will put into their hearts to do his will. But I have alleged too many places, purposing to touch only a few. For you may of yourself find out infinite such like places of scripture. Hereunto he added certain arguments, which no man shall ever be able to refute. God's omnipotency suffereth nothing to be done, which he doth not either simply, or, here there is a lacuna in the text, sort will. For look what simply he will not, that by no means can be done. His infinite wisdom doth not suffer, here there is a lacuna in the text, things in the world to be done without his advice and counsel. Whilst he willeth the end, which is, here there is a lacuna in the text, his purpose most excellent, he also willeth, here there is a lacuna in the text, means leading to these ends, at the least in some respect, but not as they are since. All things in the world which are good and positive have their being from him and are ruled by his providence, and therefore all motives or motions tending to any end, as they are motions, be ruled and directed by God. The counsels of God depend not on the works of creatures, but contrarywise, the actions and motions of creatures depend upon the counsel of God. His foreknowledge, even of things most mutable, is immutable, therefore it dependeth upon a cause immutable, that is, upon his own eternal decree. All this confirms a providence universal over all things particular, as much as may be said for God's eternal and immutable election. There can be no good at all in anything which God from eternity has not decreed to effect or bring to pass. Those whom he once loveth, he loveth from all eternity and for all eternity. We cannot therefore be assured of the present grace of God towards us, except we be also assured of his eternal grace and love, unless we will imagine God to be mutable. We must believe eternal life. Our hope must be certain. We must pray for eternal salvation without condition or doubt. Christ's intercession for the elect is ever sure. These, amongst a great many others, content me and perhaps you. Now therefore, after all this, let us hear what it is that you object. First, say you, this doctrine carries men away from God's revealed will unto his secret will, from the word to impressions or persuasions wrought by faith, before credit or belief be given to the word heard. What is this? If you have at any time seen this written in our doctrine, why do you not produce or note the places? If you think it a consequence thereupon, why do you not frame your argument and draw your consequence? What kind of logic is this, or of whom did you learn it, who railed deadly and damnably against innocence without any show of proof? But if you can neither show where we have written it, nor by good and apparent consequence force our doctrine to it, as out of doubt you cannot, why then do you so shamefully slander us? We never so much as thought of any such matter. Nay, all that we have hitherto taught is quite contrary. They which persuade you and others such things of us, they lie as wickedly and as impudently as the devil. Away then with these monstrous forgeries. It is, good sir, the express word of God, that they which, with an earnest and thankful mind in true repentance, embrace the benefit of Christ, offered in the gospel, should certainly persuade themselves that they are in favor with God through Christ, and most assured heirs of eternal life, and that not for works either done by themselves, or for seen by God, that by the meet and free mercy of God, whereby he hath about safe from all eternity to make choice of them before others, which except he had done, they had surely perished in blindness and impiety with others. We make the word of God the major of our syllogism, the testimony of conscience, that we believe and repent of the minor, in this manner. He that believeth in the Son hath eternal life, but I believe in the Son. Hence we draw this conclusion, which was in question, O God, I have eternal life. Now, I pray, tell me, is this to lead you from the word, to judge of the grace of God, and our salvation otherwise than out of the word? Truly, if yourself will judge otherwise, you shall perish everlastingly. You add farther that we rest and corrupt the text of Paul, and search too curiously into the secrets of God. Yet you neither do nor can allege any example, but instead of proofs you pester us with a few scurrile declamatory terms. If we did move such questions, why God hath rather chosen one man than another, Peter than Judas, to eternal life, whether others he also elected, what is the number of the elect, etc., then have you reason to revive us, for these are that unsearchable depth whereof Paul speaketh, and the knowledge of them is no way necessary to our salvation. For the chief cause of our salvation is God's free election, that this election is sure and immutable. It is made known unto us by such effects as we find in ourselves, namely stood up by faith, repentance, and hearing the word of God. These are things whereof God would not have us ignorant, but hath in his word a thousand times repeated, his glory and our comfort. Wherefore, your acclamations concern us nothing, howsoever you please yourself in them. Secondly, you cannot abstain from the stale and dry drops of the Manichees and Stoics, for want of better weapons to offend us. We, for our parts, detest that dotage of the Stoics touching necessity inherent in things themselves, which should bind and subject to itself God and all things besides. Contrary wise, we maintain that God is the most free and chief ruler of all things, which doth all things according to his good pleasure, whose hand no man can withdraw, which is eternal, immutable, ever the same. Why do you, under the name of fatal laws, deride his most excellent, wise, free, and immutable decree? A man might well laugh at the folly of these toys, but for that blasphemous impiety which you add, that no Christian can endure to laugh at, but rather be vehemently therewithal offended. Do you think it absurd that all things which are and ever shall be were before the fall known unto God by him decreed? Then, belike you, laugh at Paul, saying that before the foundation of the world, grace was given to us in Christ, and at St. James, saying that God's, you know, there is a lacuna in the church, are known unto him from the beginning, that is, from all eternity. But is it possible that you, having been so long conversant in philosophy and divinity, should, in your fantasy, frame unto us a mutable God? Truly, if you speak seriously, I accept against your wisdom. If you jest friendly, I must prejudice your modesty. Do you think that God was mutable in threatening but sparing the Ninevites? He had determined to spare them as well before as after his threats. 
But you'll say, why then did he threaten them? But his very cause that by threatening he might convert and having converted might save them. Therefore God was not diverse or altered his purpose. For even when he threatened them, he understood this condition, except they repented. And his repentance he did before all eternity, purpose by threatening to work in their minds. Besides, you object unto us a grievous crime in saying we overthrow and take away discipline, prayer, magistrates, and laws. Not to fast, I pray, for breaking your shins. If whatsoever God hath decreed shall come to pass, as without doubt, immutably, and necessarily it must. Discipline, say you, prayer, magistrates, and laws are to no purpose. If it were true, if he had decreed without them that his decrees should come to pass. But if by these means he would save some, restrain others, make a third sort inexcusable, and hath therefore commanded to use them, that by this commandment he might the rather move us to make use of them, and by this means it may be good as decreed unto us. Then who are you that presume to be a reformer of God's counsels, and mutter that he hath decreed or day to command the things vain and to no purpose? God hath decreed to make day to us. Will you therefore conclude that the sun riseth in vain? Because God every year bringeth corn from out of the earth, will you therefore conclude that the benefit of heaven and husbandry might be taken away? What school ever taught you from admitting the first cause to conclude a remove of second causes? When God decreed the end, he likewise ordained and decreed means unto that end, and gave us charge to use them. If we use them, it is at his pleasure, if not by his judgment, and our fault is at our own peril. Your objection of Manichaean blasphemy toucheth not us but St. Paul, one unspotted with that heresy. All are created good by one good God. By his most just permission they fell, corrupting and turning away themselves from God. Out of this perished heap he elected and reprobated from all eternity whom he would. Manius acknowledgeth none of all this. It is therefore a damnable slander to say that God did reprobate any, contrary to those sayings, God will not the death any, but that all men should be saved. He would not that any should perish, but all be saved in respect of his goodness and love towards his creatures, which will not suffer him to rejoice in the destruction of his handiwork, and may appear by commanding, calling, and inviting to repentance. Although in force and efficacy hereof prevail not in all. For in his word he hath often said that he rejoiceth in no man's death as in his word, but calleth and inviteth all men unto himself, though not all after one sort. That you effect or bring to pass that all without exception should obey and be saved, he not only said it nowhere, but in many places expressly said the contrary, so that the scripture is not contrary to itself, teaching that God rejoiceth in the salvation of all, yet hath left some to reprobation. Thirdly, I think that distrusting the weight of your arguments, you may be carried away with multitude, and did therefore use the same argument both in first and also in the third place, unless perhaps you will rather have it an amplification taken from the name of enthusiasts, that you may not be thought to have omitted this ornament. But go to, what agreement between us and them? You say that, neglecting the word, we expect ravagements of the mind from the body. But in which of our writers have you heard or read any such thing? This is spoken of us with as little modesty as that before, when you said we departed from the revealed will of God. You say that God doth work in us faith, and our conversion, but by his word, after his ordinary manner of working, whereunto he hath bound us, reserving to himself liberty of working extraordinarily, whensoever he will, as also of moving by his word, whom, when, and how far it pleaseth him. As inconsiderately you add, and I know not whether against your conscience, having been so long an auditor of our profession, that according to our doctrine the will of a man doth nothing. In both arguments, again, you dispute from admitting the first cause to the excluding of the second. The will of man is an agent, but, being before moved, acted, inclined, softened, and renewed by God through his word, I mean not forced as a stone or a block, but allured and invited by some object offered to the mind. The will of Paul was God's work, in that he would do those things which the Lord would. It was God's judgment, and the Jews' offense, that they would not be gathered together by Christ. It is in vain that grace goes before, unless it do effect the accompanying of our will. What say you then of like manner of working? Why, rather, hearken you not to that doctor of the church which saith, It is God which will be us. We can in no wise maintain the purity of the article of free and certain justification against that sort of merit which the purpose is firm, meritum congrui, except that pious device of God's general grace, leaving us to the immutable love of God towards his elect, be free from obscurity and selfishness. Fourthly, you would seem to do a thing ordinary, extraordinarily, placing the strength of your arguments in the main battle, filling your forward and rearward with pioneers and base hangbiles, contrary to that custom which you know to be observed and commanded by rhetoricians in their schools. Your chief argument is this, which you set forth to the utmost, if God have decreed to give over some to blindness, sin, and death, then God by this means is made the cause of sin. But this is easily answered. First, here again, I find your want of common ingenuity, whereas you say that these are the words of many of our writers, that God doth effectually work sin in the reprobate. You talk of many, but do, and persuaded cannot produce one. For we from our hearts detest this opinion, as infinite testimonies of our writers will easily prove. But you will say it followeth upon our doctrine, for he which decreed to suffer men to sin is the author of sin. See what an argument you have made, which, if it be turned the other way, is enough to confute you in your own conceit. For he which permitteth sin, not being bound to hinder any man from sinning, having besides authority and right to punish with forsaking and casting off to eternal torments, he is neither author nor favor, but sufferer and judge of sin. But in this sort God permitteth sin, Therefore, God is not any way the author of sin. If you proceed and urge, but that privation or withdrawing of grace which he inflicteth instead of a punishment is sin, you commit a fallacy of accident, for the punishment of itself, as it is inflicted by God, is most just. By accident, as being plucked by men in their own heads by the first sin of Adam, and the rest ensuing, so it is sin. Your argument had carried more color, if from God's providence you had concluded this effecting sin. 
although indeed it had been but the same fallacy, for God did most effectually and vehemently will be crucified of his son by death and afterwards executed it, yet he did not will but suffer the murder which he afterwards did Work, which by then he performed. He would be war with Nebuchadnezzar, but hated the wickedness. His will it was that Absalom should war against his father David and defile his wives, but these things were As Absalom did them, only to usurp the kingdom and oppress his father, not having therein any commandment of God to follow, so they were treason and incest. This wickedness of Absalom and accident concurred with God's judgment, which he executed by him. As much you shall prevail if you say that God is then made the author of sin, when as men forlorn and forsaken by him cannot choose but sin. For you accuse the scripture and God himself, often saying as much as this, but without danger of such blasphemy. Because mankind, in their own free will, did in paradise pull on themselves this necessity of sinning. Fifth, you tell us this is a doctrine of the law. What then? Is it therefore false? Is not the law as true as the gospel? Furthermore, you say it is drawn from reason itself. You had need be more eagle sighted in Plato and Aristotle with books, and all men besides have been, which could never find it there. But in a word, you know that it is learned out of the hidden mysteries of the gospel. Do you think that Paul's intent was in the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th to the Romans, and first to the Ephesians, to preach the law? I do not think you believe it. And what doth nearer concern the very marrow of the gospel than the eternal, free, and immutable love of God towards his elect, which Christ saith was the cause why he gave his only begotten Son for us, much more saved us everlastingly, being once engrafted into him through faith, and finished in us the work which he had begun? I know not what may concern the gospel if these things do not. It may suffice again to admonish you, as before, of maintaining the purity of our article of justification. Those words of yours, oh, how that exclamation troubled me, to whom doth God owe anything, filled me partly with admiration, partly with indignation and grief. I was out of patience when I read them. Surely, either you have been little conversant in reading holy scriptures, or too much possessed with affection and prejudice, and you so saucily condemn the words of scripture. Is it not the exclamation of Paul, Romans 11, verse 35, who hath first given unto the Lord, that he may recompense him? Truly, nothing more comforteth me than this unspeakable love of God towards me, that owing no more to me than to Judas or Cain, yet for all that, of an enemy he hath made me a son, by the death of his only begotten. For that which you allege of God's binding himself unto us by promise is nothing at all to the purpose. What then, I pray, will you pretend before the applying of this promise? To whom doth this promise bind God, but unto him that embraceth it by faith? But who embraceth or receiveth it, besides those on whom God doth us to bestow this benefit? He obliges himself to as many as believe, and this very obligation proceedeth of his free goodness. But where, tell me, where is the will never be able to show us. Leave then to be troubled with the word of Christ, proceeding from a most inward feeling of piety and true humility before God. Neither dream that by them, the physical doubts are confirmed. Parents rather indeed without that the soul of faith cannot consist. Sixthly, long since have been the argument they bring for universal promises, for themselves are faulty in that which they object unto us. You answer the argument and yet use it. If this universal promise did pertain to all men, what a confusion of impiety and absurdity would follow. But if it must be restrained unto those that believe, as indeed it must, we also maintain this universal truth and comfort, having learned out of God's word, that all and they alone which believe be heirs of eternal life, and so received into favor by God, that they shall forever all continue then, and not one perish according to those scriptures, no man shall take away my sheep from me, of that which my father hath given me, I will not lose, etc. That, if it were possible, the very elect should be seduced, whom he hath chosen, them he hath called, justified, and glorified. This is the conclusion of Christian faith and consolation, and this article is placed in the end of the creed, that we might believe eternal life, and with the apostles.